So hi everyone, um, thanks all for coming to listen to me today. My name's Alex um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about some work I did a couple of years ago back when I worked at the University of Salford, which is why all this has got Salford branding and not APHA branding. Um, the work uh, was conducted with Tim Gottwald, Frank van den Bosch, Nick Cuniff and Stephen Parnell. And although the title of our talk is Optimising Early Detection Surveillance for Exotic Pests and Pathogens in Plant Health, and I'm going to use a plant example today, my aim is really to show how we can use mathematical models to explore and improve surveillance activities for pests and pathogens in general, whether they affect plants or animals. Now, I haven't got a huge amount of time, so it's going to be a kind of whirlwind tour of, of this paper. So I'm going to start by quickly describing the disease we're focusing on, Huang Long Bing, and our research question. And then I'm going to talk a bit about risk-based surveillance um, and the use of site metrics in that. And then I'll go on to how we talk about optimization, how this performs and what it can tell us about optimal survey deployment. So let's start off with Huang Long Bing. Um, it's a disease of citrus uh, caused by a bacterial pathogen that's spread by these tiny insects called psyllids. And it's a problem in most of the citrus growing world, which is demarcated by this world citrus belt here. <clears throat> and as it's a, a vector-borne pathogen, it needs a competent vector in place to spread, and that vector has spread throughout the world. Uh, the, the vector we're particularly interested in is the Asian citrus psyllid, which originates from Asia. Um, but as you can see, that um, vector has spread out into South America, North America. I'm going to focus today on the situation in Florida. Um, in this uh, location, the vector was first identified in the state in 1998. And in 2005, the actual disease was first detected in citrus. By the time it was first detected, it had already spread a good way and it was already pretty well established. So it was first found in two counties in 2005. It increased up to 12 counties, 2006, 24, 2007. And then by early 2008, it was in 30 um, different counties. And by the end of 2008, all the commercial citrus counties in the state had experienced the disease. And right now, the future is not looking particularly great for citrus production in Florida. So. What I'm really looking at is this question of where should we have been looking for Huang Long Bing in Florida before it first arrived back in 2005? And it's quite a prescient question, given that the vector, although not the pathogen, fingers crossed, has recently been detected for the first time in the EU in Cyprus. So uh, back before 2005, Florida were well aware there was a risk of Huang Long Bing, and we're, we want to be able to detect this at an early stage if it arrives. So what we're looking at is what I'm going to call early detection surveillance. Now, this requires detecting a pathogen when it's still present at really low levels and doing this, having a surveillance scheme that's in place repeatedly. So it's continually looking, really. Um, so um, in this kind of case, randomly selecting where to look isn't really going to be an option. It's going to require huge numbers of samples to detect at very low prevalences. And if we have to do it again and again, that obviously that increases the cost. So we're going to be looking at what we call risk based surveillance, and that's a more efficient way where basically we consider that not every site or not every host is created equal in terms of value for surveillance. And we want to identify which of those hosts or sites we want to target for our surveillance activities. Um, now, this is going to be affected by a huge number of different factors, and that's why I'm going to start talking a little bit about models. But generally, we want to focus our resources on which areas or which hosts are most likely to be infected. That will give us the greatest bang for our buck. Um, so as I mentioned, Huang Long Bing is a disease of citrus, so a good place to start is looking at where the hosts are. So this is the distribution of citrus in Florida from around the time that we're interested in. And you can see the main citrus growing areas here kind of around the centre of the state. These greyed out areas are where citrus levels are, are low enough to effectively be ignored. But it's not just a case of hosts being present. We also need to think about where the pathogen may enter if it came into the, the state. Now, the main risk for Huang Long Bing was probably being brought in um, as people moved around the world and carried things in, in their luggage and in their baggage. So uh, my co-author, Tim Gottwald, created this map of um, the risk of human assisted movement of, of the Huang Long Bing pathogen um, into the state. Uh, he's also created this model, there's a paper down here that you could look at, which shows how this approach can be used for all sorts of different pathogens. It's a really interesting read. I'd strongly recommend that. Um, so we have these two possible risk maps. Which of these do we choose? Which one is more important? And are we missing anything if we only consider these two? Now, for full disclosure, I should point out my role at the APHA um, is to coordinate simulation modelling activities. So 
can see where I'm going here. Maybe we could actually capture a lot of what we're looking at if we create a simulation model, which can account for all of these, as well as information uh, about the epidemiology. So it won't surprise you to know that the answer is, yeah, we can create a simulation model. So we did. Um, we created a model of pathogen transmission. As you can see here, uh, this red area shows, as we run this model, kind of where the pathogen is spreading. And we ran this model up to a prevalence of about 1% to see kind of where it's spread in those early stages of disease, where spread is kind of more predictable. Once path the pathogen enters, we don't need to worry about issues like control measures or density-dependent constraints. We can just look at that very initial stage of spread. Now, this um, animation here shows just a single model realization, but a major value of creating these simulation models, especially well, stochastic simulation models, is that we can run this again and again and again, and we get a really good idea of the range of possible spread scenarios we might see. So it's entered here in the middle of the state at this one, but it might also enter in other areas, and we can capture that uh, using a stochastic model. So we ran this model a thousand times and we took the average end prevalence in each of our one kilometre cells over all of those runs. So you can see we can identify here there's a high risk area down in the kind of south of the states where the mean end prevalence was higher than elsewhere. So that's really valuable. We can put a number to that and we can start to think about how we might then deploy our surveillance resources. This is a quick summary of what we've done here. We've plugged in our host distribution, our entry distribution, other relevant epidemiological parameters like the spread rate and the spread distance into our model. We've generated a whole load of model outputs, and then from those, we condense them all down and we can look at um, overall where are the most likely areas to be affected. And then obviously we would take this a step further, identify which areas we should sample, and then considering the sample size, go out and sample them. Now, before we go rushing out to go and sample anything, we need to think about how well this surveillance is going to perform. So to do this, we need to think about what our surveillance aim is exactly going to be. Um, now, I mentioned we're interested in early detection surveillance. So let's say um, that the surveillance performance indicator that we're interested in is the probability of detecting infection before we hit this prevalence of 1%. So, um, to, do, to evaluate how well our surveillance is going to work, we need to create a kind of model that captures that. Um, so we created a detection model. Now, this is where we start to plug in other parameters that are relevant to our surveillance strategy. So this might be the performance of our detection method, so the diagnostic sensitivity, the probability that, you're, that you correctly identify an infected host. Uh, we're going to look at our sample frequency. Remember, as I mentioned, this is going to be a recurrent surveillance activity. Um, and obviously our sample size will also go into this detection model when we're looking at how well it performs. Um, but we also need to consider the fact that our pathogen is a dynamic, is in a dynamic state and is changing over time. So we go back to our simulation model and we can actually start plugging these in individual outputs. Obviously, we can run it again, create a whole new range of outputs so that we're not basing our evaluation on, on the same data, same outputs that we generated uh, to uh, target these sites. But we could run our model again, generate model outputs, and then plug these into the detection model. Now you'll notice here, we're not condensing these down. The value of taking these model outputs is that we want to see what happens in each individual scenario, and we want to treat that separately. So we take each individual scenario, and we look at that separately within our detection model. We don't marginalize over all of our different model realizations, or we can look at exactly what happened in each of those scenarios. So we're looking at using site-specific metrics. So we've got a value attached to each of our sites. How should we select these sites? One way to go about that is to rank them all and just take the, the top 20 or whatever, however many sites we want to take. And if we do that, we get this kind of result here shown on the left. we have basically be condensing all of our surveillance resource into one site. And that's understandable because with these kind of things, um, as we saw before, uh, there's a lot of risk associated in one particular area. So we have spatial autocorrelation between our individual sites. So all of our highest risk sites are all quite close together. Um, uh, the problem with doing this is that you're basically putting all your eggs into one basket. And if introduction, if the pathogen actually entered somewhere else, so maybe if the pathogen entered down in the bottom of the state, maybe it won't actually reach here at all. And if we're only looking in this one area, there's a chance that we miss infection altogether. So as you can see, our probability of detection when we just rank our methods and take those top few uh, is actually quite low. So instead, when we were using our ranking approaches, when we're using our kind of site, site metric approaches, 
Um, instead of just ranking them, we basically had a stochastic approach where we selected sites proportional to this site's metric. So it means that those higher rank, those higher ranked sites are more likely to be selected, but we're definitely not just taking the higher ranked ones. Um, so this is one realization from that. So um, this, as you can see, it spreads out our surveillance a lot more. So we're now not just focusing on our kind of highest risk area, but we're spreading our surveillance out across the state. Um, and there's still a few clusters because it's, it's still capturing some of that spatial autocorrelation in risk, uh, but it's overall giving a much higher probability of detection. So how do these different methods compare? Has our model approach method actually improved upon looking at citrus density or looking at kind of where the pathogen is likely to enter? Um, we compared the different approaches. So this graph shows how our probability of detection, shown here on the y-axis, varies as we sample more sites. So obviously, as you'd expect, as you sample more sites, your detection probability increases. If we were just selecting randomly, we see that it's actually not a get an almost linear increase um, in our probability of detection because we're not targeting towards high risk areas. But you can clearly see from this that our model approach is outperforming all of the other approaches. Although in some cases, kind of model approach and the citrus density alone uh, perform fairly similar. OK, so that's one way to go about surveillance. Um, but there's, I feel there's kind of more that we could do. So we're going back to this um, model again. So we have our simulation model up here. We have our detection model down here. Um, and we have all these different things captured between these two models. But all of this is still underpinned by this box here, which is which host scenarios do we sample? So we still need to plug in an arrangement of hosts, um, or arrangement of kind of areas to sample to kind of run all this and get our overall probability of detection. So if we had a really small problem, we could just kind of consider every possible arrangement of sampling sites and then just select the best one as our kind of optimal approach. Obviously, when we're talking about a landscape that has hundreds of thousands of cells in it, we can't consider every possible combination. We need some kind of way of basically evaluating our probability of detection and using that to inform which hosts or areas we should sample. And this is where the optimization comes in. So we can use an optimization algorithm, which basically will link together this um, probability of detection um, with our question of where we're sampling. So uh, our optimization algorithm will um, look at our probability of detection and then make some changes and tweaks and see if we can improve upon that. And as we run this algorithm, it will gradually identify which arrangement of sites maximizes our predicted um, performance, our predicted probability of detection. Now, I'm getting low on time, so I won't go into a lot of detail on this, but the algorithm we chose to use was called simulated annealing. Um, and the way this algorithm works is that it runs over a sequence of iterations. So we run it and it takes step by step by step uh, towards trying to optimize this arrangement of sites. So this graph here shows our iterations running along the x-axis and then our probability of detection running up the y-axis. And as you can see at the start, basically it takes a site it takes an arrangement of sites randomly and it evaluates our probability of detection. And then it makes a change to that. It will take one site out and change to select another random site and it reevaluates that probability. And then it will always select better arrangements, but at the start, it will also often select worse arrangements. And that allows it to kind of explore the parameter space a little bit more. As time goes on and this iteration number increases, it will be less likely to select worse arrangements. So you can see this kind of up and down gets a lot less as time goes on until it kind of converges out towards an approximation to the optimal arrangement. This is how it looks kind of if we run through in our kind of particular example. So you can see it's changing our range of sites all the time. We're exploring the parameter space here, but as time goes on and our optimization algorithm runs through those iterations, you can see it gradually starts to converge on an arrangement of sites. Our probability detection is reaching, approaching one in this case, uh, but reaching basically our optimal arrangement until it settles out in one kind of fixed approximation of that optimal arrangement of sites. And if we go back to our plot of how um, our number of sites um, and our probability of detection are related, we can see now our optimal approach, which is this black line here, outperformed all of our risk metric approaches. Um, 
Or to put it another way, the number of sites that we'd need to visit when we use our optimised method um, is much lower than the number of sites we'd need to visit under the other methods to achieve a given probability of detection. If we run these methods multiple times using the same kind of model outputs, we also see a lot less variation in the performance of that optimal approach in contrast to these rank based methods, which, like I said, each time you're just taking one possible realization uh, because we're not just taking those top ranked approaches. My final point I wanted to touch on as well, as well as pinpointing particular locations to conduct surveillance, it tells us a little bit about how we should actually be going about surveillance. So you've seen these plots on the left and the right before. This shows our one cluster we get when we just rank out approaches, our metric approaches. And this is on the right if we kind of take a stochastic approach to those. If we look at the arrangement of sites in our optimised approach, we can see we have this kind of middle number of clusters. We have eight clusters, so we've got spread across the state, but there is still some kind of definite clustering of surveillance sites, and that's giving our, our highest probability of detection. So in that case, does that mean we should always be trying to figure out some, some kind of middle ground between kind of a single cluster and a large number of clusters? And we found that the actual answer to that depends on your sensitivity of your test. If you've got a test with a very poor sensitivity, you're actually much better putting all your eggs in one basket because you're so likely to miss infection with each of your individual um, tests, each of your individual samples, um, that you need to focus really on those real high risk areas. Whereas as you increase the sensitivity, you're able to spread your resources out further across the state, across the field. So in summary, we can use simulation models to incorporate a lot of different risk factors simultaneously to plan risk-based surveillance. By interrogating the outputs of these models using a detection model, we can evaluate the performance of any st surveillance strategy, accounting for all these different factors. Um, and by applying an optimization routine to then that detection model, we can then approximate the surveillance deployment, which maximizes a given surveillance aim, as well as telling us something about how different factors affect surveillance deployment. Thank you very much for your time. I'll take any questions.